Good afternoon. My name is Dr. Cheryl Finley, and it's my great pleasure this afternoon to be joined in a conversation about the profession of art therapy by Dr. Cheryl Doby Copeland and also by Deanna Barton. And so today, uh, during this lunchtime hour, we will have a conversation about the profession and practice of art therapy. And as a description, I can share with you that art therapy is, is a profession that we can think about through the active art making practice that pairs the creative process and applied psychology with a psychotherapeutic practice. Art therapy also offers a means of communication for people who cannot find words to express anxiety, pain, and emotions. Art therapy is a rewarding interdisciplinary profession that unites art and psychology to improve the lives of people of all ages and walks of life. Um, and I think that now as especially on this particular day, uh, March 11th, we're celebrating the one year uh, anniversary of, uh, of being uh, confronted with the global uh, pandemic. Um, this conversation could not be more timely. Um, I'd like to share with you the biographies of, uh, of our um, art therapist today. Dr. Cheryl Doby Copeland received her BFA in art education and MPS in art therapy and creativity development from Pratt Institute and continued to earn her PhD in school psychology at Howard University. With over 43 years as a, as a clinical art therapist, she has shown commitment to working in the public sector with underserved and marginalized clients. She has been employed by the Department of Behavioral Health for the District of Columbia government since 1994 and currently works on a clinical team providing culturally competent art therapy to children and families. She has authored numerous publications as, and has been a regular presenter at the annual conference since 1997. Dobie Copeland has also been adjunct faculty at the George Washington University's art therapy program since 1998, and has also served as an external reviewer for EVMS students cul culminating projects. She has mentored countless students, particularly African-American students and new professionals throughout her career. Deanna Barton is a board certified art therapist, art educator, and artist. In 2016, she founded Artspiration LLC, and she's a, um, a, and now alumna to help people of color process deep pain creative, creatively uh, and, and to creatively begin to heal and change their narratives through art expression and art making. She received a master's in art therapy from the George Washington University and completed her undergraduate studies at Spelman College. Welcome back, uh, Deanna Barton. Deanna is a member of the art, American Art Therapy Association's Multicultural Committee and is working to increase diversity and equity within the field of art therapy by educating and supporting students of color interest in pursuing careers in expressive therapies. Deanna works with young women of color healing from anxiety, depression, perfectionism, and experiences of childhood racial and workplace trauma. She believes we are intrinsically creative and expressing our creativity can help us find balance and fulfillment in life as we strive to grow and heal. So without further ado, I welcome you, Deanna and Cheryl, and thank you so much again for joining us. Our pleasure. Thank you for having us. Yes. Welcome. So. <laughs> Hi. Hi. <laughs> we are. Um, should we start on talking about just how we came to become art therapists? That sounds good. Yeah. I'll let you take the lead on that. Uh, oh boy. Okay. I'll, I'll follow. <laughs> so many years ago, um, I was working on my bachelor's at Pratt Institute. And that was to actually become an art teacher. And at that time, this was in the late 70s, I finished my bachelor's degree only to learn that they were not hiring art teachers. And um, coincidentally, at around the same time, I started to learn about art therapy. And Pratt actually had or has 
uh, an art therapy, graduate art therapy program. But, you know, I didn't know much about it. So I was fortunate that my dad had a friend who was in charge of the volunteer department at Brooklyn State Hospital, which is a large psychiatric hospital in Brooklyn, New York. Mm -hmm. He allowed me over my spring break to spend some time with a woman who ran an art shop in this hospital so that I could get a sense as to whether or not I would be comfortable working around um, individuals that had significant mental illness. And these were primarily adult chronic schizophrenics. Mm. So I did that for a few weeks. I went back, I applied to Pratt's program. I was accepted and um, actually was able to be hired because the woman with whom I was volunteering retired and recommended me for her position. So mm -hmm. I was very, very fortunate when I was working on my master's to actually be working, not calling myself an art therapist, but actually being able to apply what I was learning all at the same time. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So was coming into art therapy almost like, I need a job, I need a field that's going to allow me to you know, pay the bills. And so you fell into this kind of um, because there, you know, art teaching wasn't an option or? Kind of, yeah. I mean, I was fortunate to learn of a profession that still allowed me to utilize my interest in having art making be key to the work that I was doing. So yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. sure. I actually also taught art as an entry point to the field, but kind of a, a segue or kind of a, a hiatus, if you will. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess I'll share a bit of my journey. It, it actually started on Spelman's campus. Okay. Um, I was in a, a sculpture class with uh, the late Frank Toby Martin, who at the time, I think it was like after class and we were just kind of chatting as we were creating. And he mentioned art therapy, knowing that I was also, I was a minor in art and a, um, a major in psychology. So he kind of just mentioned it, you know, haphazardly like, hey, have you ever heard of it? I was like, no, I've never heard of it. So from there, it kind of expanded my awareness. And um, I, I really have to say that the art professors at Spelman kind of cultivated my interest and gave me opportunities to begin to explore art and healing within the confines of you know, the campus and my classes and coursework. Mm -hmm. um, and I actually was able as an art minor to present in the senior exhibition, which usually is you know, kind of exclusive for the art majors. And at that point, I kind of had a first opportunity to expose my own healing process through art, through self-portraiture in this art exhibition and kind of talk about, you know, my healing journey and how I see myself coming into art therapy. And that was like truly the kind of spark that, you know, ignited this whole um, trajectory of my, you know, my career path. And then from there, went into George Washington University, got my master's and kind of um, continued on. And then after having a job as a clinical art therapist at a, um, in the Miami-Dade County Public Schools, I had that position for a little while. And then as usual, you know, budget cuts happen, things happen. Arts are typically the first thing to go. And so my position as an art therapist was kind of shifted into art teaching. And okay. that was the way I was able to kind of keep a job at the time. Mm -hmm. So similarly, you know, I kind of exactly. fell into art education, mm -hmm. um, had that position for a while and, you know, was always feeling kind of called back to practice mm -hmm. in the therapeutic space. Um, and so as I taught, I kind of begun to build um, what now is Aluma on the side. So seeing clients in private practice on the weekends and just like slowly kind of cultivating this art and wellness business that is kind of where I operate today. Good. So my path took a, a, a different turn. After I finished the um, program at Pratt, I stayed at the psychiatric hospital for about 18 years, mm -hmm. but um, that was in Brooklyn, New York, but I am originally from Washington, DC, and I just felt the pull to come back to be closer to family and home. I had two young children at the time um, and so over the course of my career, I have worked at that large psychiatric hospital. When I left there, I came to DC and started working at a maximum security juvenile detention facility. 
Mm. which was very interesting. But what I have found, and one thread, I would just say this right now, that has carried all through the different places that I work was the responsiveness to using art making as a vehicle to help people to communicate. Yeah. Um, and then from there, I was transferred, you know, not because of something I wanted, but, you know, sometimes there are no mistakes, um, into a clinic where I worked with families and they had children of all ages. And that gave me an opportunity because granted there's a big difference between when I took my training back in the you know, late seventies and you now. <laughs> um, so for example, when I was at that clinic, I realized that part of my training did not include a course on family art therapy mm -hmm. early then. Mm -hmm. So I was blessed to work with um, Elaine Goldberg, who was working with us, she was clinical psychologist, but she had her ATR and she helped me to learn about live supervision. And um, Catherine Williams knew of me because of some of my work with the American Art Therapy Association and asked me to come to GW to teach a course that was going to be um, an elective on cultural competence, I'll just say. Um, and Barbara Sobel allowed me to audit her class so that I could really learn about family art therapy. So I had all of these strands, you know, happening at the same time. And so now I am actually, again, working in a community-based clinic, but primarily with children and families with children who are under the age of eight. So mm. it's quite different, but here too, they have been able to respond to art therapy. So it's yeah. really been rewarding. For sure. Mm -hmm. um, interested to go back to when you mentioned, you know, being brought into GW to teach that cultural competency class. Um, I remember taking the culture and diversity class when I attended GW. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. at the time, I, I want to say we may have been one of the, you know, first class or early classes or, you know, cohorts that actually were given that option to take the course. Mm -hmm. And it was in conjunction with a study abroad program. Mm -hmm. So we actually took the class in mm -hmm. India. We mm -hmm. were there for three weeks and we got to, you know, completely immerse ourselves in the community and mm -hmm. provide our therapy to different sites. And mm -hmm. I just remember that class bringing you know, I, I guess the, the point of the class is to prepare us to work in diverse communities. Mm -hmm. um, but I found that in actuality, that class brought up a lot of stuff for oh, sure. students, mm -hmm. you know, it was a, a very emotional class. Mm -hmm. um, and so I'm just interested, you know, do you think we're moving in the right direction as, as far as supporting our graduate students and in, in cultural competency and understanding how to work in communities that may not be like their own? Mm -hmm. Well, clearly back then when the class started and even now it all, it typically brings up um, emotions, you know, depending upon how the courses are structured. But I know for um, the one that I offered at GW and even how it's offered now, because even though I'm not teaching it um, regularly, I come back and lecture each year. Um, one of my former students, Jordan Portash, is actually spearheading it now along with uh, another colleague of ours. Um, I find that the material really brings forth a lot of emotions because this is an, an area that people are uncomfortable with. So then, you know, and that was back in 1997, I believe, when it started, as now, it still is relevant. Um, I'm, I would like to think that given the increased attention nationally and internationally on issues of race, you know, racial disparity, um, institutional racism, just, you know, all the isms, yeah. um, that we are finding ways for people to be more at ease with addressing this because I've always said this, every encounter, every encounter that I've had with a client is cross-cultural. So regardless of whether or not their skin tone is similar to mine, their experience is different. Mm -hmm. And so having this information has to be useful. And we're moving from just this notion of cultural competence, which can tend to, which tends to be finite, you know, that mm -hmm. people think they go through the stages along the cultural competence continuum and they come to cultural proficiency and then they've got it. We've moved from that to more 
um, taking a cultural humility approach so that the value is placed on ongoing self-reflection, ongoing recognition that the people to whom you're providing services are really the experts of their cultural experience and we should be open to learning to them. So finding ways to help students to embrace that, I think is critical to their being effective when they're working with clients. Yeah, definitely yeah. agree. Mm -hmm. I also think this kind of brings us into the question of, you know, what a typical day is like for us yeah, working yeah. with clients <laughs> and this idea of approaching our work with cultural humility and, mm -hmm. you know, through the lens of like, even if you look like me, our stories, our narratives are, are very different. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and so maybe just taking some time for each of us to, you know, share what a typical day is like with the populations mm -hmm. we work with. Right. Why don't you start? Because you're working privately yeah. primarily, right? And I'm in yeah. a clinic. For sure. Um, so a typical day for me is honestly very similar to what's happening right now, where mm -hmm. I'm face to face virtually since, um, you know, since the, this time last year, uh, working one on one with clients and at times in group group settings virtually. So a lot of our work, honestly, is, is focused on allowing to reclaim their space and mm -hmm. a sense of self and identity. Um, I would say the majority of my clients are struggling with issues of racial stress and trauma. Okay. I think it's been heightened in the past year or two, just given everything that's going on. And, and I'm finding that the isolation of being home, not being able to go to work or school is just really intensifying that. And so that, that intimate space that we share with ourselves becomes almost like an unsafe space. You're right. alone, you're distressed, you're, you know, you're, going through all these emotions and feelings and you have nowhere and no, no one to share that with. So this space, you know, the art therapy setting, the, 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 the art making creative process be kind of, kind of becomes that, that, that space where they can actually take up space mm -hmm. and allow their feelings to come to the surface or to the paper. Um, so there's a lot of dialoguing, you know, there's a lot of creative process happening actively in a session um, I'm very client focused and kind of uh, strength based in my approach. So we're not necessarily talking about what's not right or how terrible they feel. Mm -hmm. You know, we're, we're that comes up naturally in, in the flow of conversation, but it's very much focused on, you know, who are you? What do you need? How are you being taken care of? You know, providing that support mm -hmm. and also giving them that uh, creative experience as an outlet for mm -hmm. everything that they're carrying all day long. And sometimes this is that one hour, you know, where they can just kind of literally let their hair down, let it out and, mm -hmm. and just kind of feel like it's being addressed and not just having to be like swallowed and bottled up and carried, which right. I think is the experience that many of us, you know, have from day to day. What age range are you primarily working with, Deanna? Yeah, currently I'm working with young adult um, women of color, mostly black women. Uh, so ages range from about 19 to I'd say early 30s. Okay. Um, sometimes I take teens and of course there are some older uh, adults that come into the practice from time to time. Okay. Yeah. So for me now, as I said before, I'm working with an early intervention population. Most of the families with whom I work have youngsters ages eight and below. So mm -hmm. right now, the youngest child on my caseload is two years old. Wow. So yes, in recognition of, you know, this being the anniversary of the declaration of the pandemic, we literally went from March 13th last year from fully face to face to the father, that was a Friday if I remember correctly, that following Monday, fully virtual. Mm -hmm. So that in and of itself was a huge shift, you know, and I'm sure everybody has their um, remembering of what that was like for them. Um, but a typical day, I guess part of it, I would say, depends upon the phase of treatment that I'm in with the client. So, for example, if I'm in the assessment and engagement phase, I may be um, looking at how I can orient this family to the use of art making as a vehicle with whom to explore their feelings and to plan treatment. So before we shifted to virtual, a lot of that would encompass coming into the art therapy space. Um, one of the approaches that I really like to use is the family art evaluation and just seeing uh, a family 
use art materials in a structured way that they may not be used to working together in and using that to show them how the art making can reveal what the course of the work might be. Mm -hmm. um, when we shift into the core intervention phase, then again, as you indicated, looking at the strengths, looking at how we can build on um, what they bring to the table, not really interpreting the art making, but you know, if I'm fortunate, my, my art therapy room now is not as um, well endowed as one that I had back in the day when I worked at that large state hospital. I had a huge art space that had ceramics and oil paints and space for murals and all of that. Now I'm in a condensed space, which is fine. I'm not complaining, but you know, taking a child-centered approach, I prefer to have as many different materials as I can. Um, depending upon what the work encompasses and a lot of the cases that I have now are children who are in the child welfare system, children who are in foster care, children who have been exposed to trauma. And so it's a dance between them leading the play or leading the work, because I incorporated play therapy as well, um, to sometimes me directing them to do something. And then when we get into the termination and recapitulation phase, this is really where we may plan together how the course of the work is going to end, but also being able to do a, a review of what they've made all along. I mean, to me, that's one of the beauties of doing art therapy, that you have a tangible product that over the course of time, they can look at to see the progress and the changes and the, just the nuances of the work, you know, all along the way. So a lot of it really hinges on the direction that the child might take me, but also helping the parent to understand how we're using art making to address. Because I've had people say, well, we can color and we can do stuff at home. Right. Now that it's shifted to virtual, it has been a little more challenging, particularly engaging little people over this platform. Clearly, yeah. just the context of the pandemic has added another layer to what we're dealing with. So you have kids who are complaining about, you know, having to go to school, parents complaining about having to be teachers, you know, and that's an overlay over some of the other presenting problems that brought them there in the first place. But fortunately, you know, with my colleagues, we have supported each other through this. And I've got, you know, some new skills. You know, I've learned how to do, use a virtual sand tray. Um, oh, wow. I've, I've learned how, you know, to take the child-centered approach, not expect a family to have a lot of art supplies because this shift happened so quickly. I didn't have time to think, much less plan on getting, you know, discrete art materials to these families. Um, but they have things at home. Yesterday, a young lady did a painting, you know, just in the course of our working together, she agreed to do some art making. She did this beautiful painting that looked like a watercolor color. And at the end, when she said, I need to clean the brush, turns out she was painting with the toothbrush. Are you see? Oh my goodness. <laughs> I was like, oh my God, you know, hopefully it's Innovation. Not, you know, and then I said, I hope this was an old toothbrush. <laughs> but anyway, you know, just the resourcefulness and yeah. to reframe it that she really wanted to do art making. So she used literally, literally mm -hmm. what she had on hand. So for sure. Yeah. yeah. I think that really brings up a good point about, you know, resiliency, resourcefulness, you know, and also the like destigmatization of mental health mm -hmm. and like what a therapeutic space looks and feels like. Mm -hmm. I find, as you kind of spoke about earlier, the receptiveness of the art making process seems to work very well in communities of color mm -hmm. because the structure of the therapeutic uh, process is very different. You know, we're not just talking directly about their trauma. We're talking about the artwork, we're immersing them in creative process. It's a sensory process. It's activating all parts of the brain. Absolutely. Um, and so in many ways, it, it becomes a little less threatening. It mm -hmm. becomes a little maybe safer, feels a little mm -hmm. you know, um, less invasive mm -hmm. when mm -hmm. discussing what's going on. And so just kind of thinking about where we are today and this kind of new normal of the virtual realm and having to work with clients 
through a screen. And I know as art therapists, a lot of our um, support in that process is through obser you know, observation. You know, how are they, how much pressure are they using with that crayon? You know, mm -hmm, how, mm -hmm. how much space on the paper are they taking up and what might this be revealing? How might we guide, you know, guide some questions around that aspect of like the formal elements of the art making. Mm -hmm. So I'm curious how, how have you adapted that nonverbal kind of observation in the, in the virtual realm? It's still challenging um, because it's not like I can coach them to turn the camera so that I can see them doing the actual create creation of the artwork. A lot of times, and you know, this is where the disparity comes in with just technology in and of itself. I can't tell you how many of my sessions are really clients using a cell phone as opposed to a tablet or a laptop. So that makes it difficult. Um, but what I have been able to do is just be able to sit with watching what I can see. You know, yesterday a younger child told me she didn't want me to talk while or say anything. And, and that's fine, you know, while she was creating because I wanted to be a surprise. I said, mm -hmm. okay, yeah. you know, and so I was very quiet and following her directions. Um, and then in the end, just encouraging her to tell the story of what it is that she made. And so to me, you know, my expectations now because it's virtual of how much time I can spend with them, of what constitutes a beneficial experience mm -hmm. between us um, has shifted slightly. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's simply a check-in. Sometimes it's really quick. Um, other times it's them showing me stuff. You know, I've literally learned because kids are like this with adapting to, to technology. And I've got a couple of young males that I work with that have taught me a few tricks with regard to navigating, um, you know, just things you can do on Zoom or on, you know, one of the other platforms. Um, I've even been able to use the whiteboard on Zoom with some of my cases where we can yeah. interact with the family drawing together mm -hmm. on the whiteboard, which is limited with the colors, but it's better, yeah. it's better than nothing. So. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I know that we have an audience of, you know, students from the AUC present, and I'm sure many are wondering, you know, where is the field headed? And, and more mm -hmm. particularly for people of color, for, for Black people, you know, thinking about having to adapt to the virtual, I imagine the field also is in a stage of adaptation to being more inclusive, both from, you know, professionals coming in as practitioners, but also for how we serve those populations and those individuals. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So just, you know, thoughts about where we're headed, how do we continue to kind of decolonize therapy, destigmatize therapy and make more space of, you know, for healing for, for people of color. Wow. That's, that's a major piece. Um, you know, early on in my career, with the Art Therapy Association, um, a lot of what I found myself advocating for was just what we find ourselves talking about now. Um, so if you can imagine back in the 1980s, the profession was less diverse than it is now. Um, this was also around the time when even with coursework, we were advocating for coursework that was reflective of more diversity. Um, and so we've, we've continued that. I, I would say that now, because this has moved from just something that a few people are, are pushing for, that it is a major focus that I am encouraged that we're moving in the right direction. Obviously, we have a lot of work to do. Even within the um, membership organization, there's much more attention being paid towards diversity, equity, and inclusion mm -hmm. with you know, listening sessions, with um, finding ways to um, use the multicultural committee. I'm a member as, long, as you are, um, to be front and center with these issues. Also looking at how the coursework, I think across the different programs that are offering um, art therapy training 
are making themselves more accessible to diverse populations. So for example, there are programs that actually offer fellowships for students to attend who have previously been at HBCUs. You know, so I would suggest, you know, the students who might be interested in pursuing training in art therapy, look for that kind of um, um, offering so that they can access it because it, it can be prohibitive. I, I, I get that. But the only way we can really increase the field is, you know, getting the word out, maybe even as you are, are starting to do, Deanna, um, preparing um, presentations to high school students, you know, doing career uh, conversations like we're doing, um, just getting the word out because, you know, when I started, art therapy was about 10 years old. And then to hear you say when you started, you hadn't heard of it either. And even now we're still hearing of people who still haven't heard of it. And we passed our 50th anniversary a couple yeah. of years ago. <laughs> so we need to get the word out because I do agree with what you said. Um, this profession could resonate with so many people because they're different places, they're different venues where you can offer it. Um, you know, my background has been primarily clinical, but there, as you talk, you could do it in school settings. You could do it in with veterans populations. You could do it in community arts centers. You could do it, you know, in the um, incarcerate with prisons. You know, so there's so many different um, areas where our therapy would be beneficial. We just need to find a way to make it accessible for people to get the training. Right. I also think there's a need to make space for other approaches and theories of, you know, psychology in mm -hmm. particular. And not traditional ways of working. Mm -hmm. Exactly. You mm -hmm. know, and making space for some of these processes of ancestral healing that are very much alive mm -hmm. in our communities mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and expanding the work that we do in maybe more tra non-traditional ways, which mm -hmm. I think I've kind of myself moved away from clinical into the more community based okay based work and thinking of it less of just as a practice mm -hmm. you know where it's very much one-on-one -on -one individual work but expanding into almost business how mm -hmm. can we how can we provide opportunities for people to make art just every day how mm -hmm. can we cultivate the art practice like we do a yoga practice mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. or something of that line where it becomes a sense of you know you achieving and maintaining well-being mm -hmm. um, day to day and not just when you are in crisis not just when you are in the deepest despairs of depression but just your day-to-day -day mm -hmm. recharging you mm -hmm. know and so mm -hmm. finding self-care exactly mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah I agree a hundred percent I mean we need to find a way for people to recognize that there's a continuum if you will of ways that you can attend to yourself our, our method is one. It doesn't always have to be the formal um, clinical setting. You're absolutely right. I agree. And being able to incorporate these processes, you know, from whatever resonates with someone um, should be considered. I absolutely agree. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So I think we might be getting close to time for Q&A. Um, Are we? Okay, yeah. it's like we've only been talking for a few minutes. <laughs> <laughs> Time goes fast. I'm, I'm wondering if we can maybe leave some words of wisdom, you know, yeah. some little gems yeah. to inspire and motivate, encourage future, future art there. I think if there was one piece of advice that I would give, and I, I would be interested to hear your thoughts on this, but over the years, I have recognized the value in having good supervision. Mm. Um, particularly now, you know, all throughout my career. So, you know, obviously it's extremely important when you're an art therapist in training because, you know, just the difference between the application of the theories and everything that you're learning in class to when you're in your internship or practicum, you know, that's clearly when you need a supervisor to help you to guide you through the process. Mm -hmm. But I've come to appreciate having a good clinical supervisor even now, okay, after all these mm -hmm. years of working, because the cases that I have are so multi-layered, um, historical trauma, you know, now with the overlay of COVID and the pandemic is adding a new dimension. So it's very, very important 
um, to seek out and, and really engage in that process with someone who can help you to self-reflect because you're holding the perspective. And in my case, I'm holding the perspective of the child, sometimes of the foster parent, of the bio parent, and trying to, you know, use that, how it impacts me to inform the interventions that we're going to use in the work. And it could be very challenging, particularly in trauma cases, to find yes. a benevolent intent when you know that the person who caused this child to be in, in care in the first place has not reconciled that with the child. Mm -hmm. So yeah, good supervision. I, I wholeheartedly recommend it. I would agree with that 100%. I think supervision is needed and, and maybe the additional to that would be also, you know, being in your, in, being in therapy for yourself mm -hmm. throughout mm -hmm. your professional life as well mm -hmm. for that exact same reason. You know, how do you remove your own stuff from mm -hmm. the therapeutic mm -hmm. setting mm -hmm. and making sure mm -hmm. that you're taking care of yourself outside of that because the work is very heavy at times. Mm -hmm. um, and I think for me personally, like the artwork is what sometimes mm -hmm. sticks with me well after the session. And I find mm -hmm. myself recalling kind of in the same way that we respond to, you know, vicariously to things we see in the media that can happen yes. as a to being definitely re-traumatized just from the things you're seeing your clients produce. Absolutely. Um, so, you know, going back to that place, like self-care, mm -hmm. maintaining your own mental health and wellness is, is super important and very vital. I agree. Um, yeah, I agree. Absolutely. <laughs> so should we see if there are questions? Um, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure if we'll read Ms. them Rachel, out. Rachel, are we... Deferring to you at this point, or looks like she's coming back in. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think you're, you're, yeah, you're, you're muted. muted. Uh huh. <laughs> That's been a great, great conversation. The two of you, um, I just have to say, one of the things that I've observed and loved about your repartee is that it's natural, it's free flowing, and it's also intergenerational. And, um, and I just, I just want to just put that out there that it's something that I've, I've noticed. And I don't know if either of you would have something to say about that. And the idea of supervision and mentorship and, you know, the way that one comes into a profession, I think also has shown through in, in your conversation, because it is just, it seems like it's a natural extension of what you already do. So Thank you. Well, I would agree. Mentors are very important. I've had some key mentors over the course of my career from when I was in training at Pratt, from Cliff Joseph to um, Joseph Garay and his human, hum, humanistic approach to art therapy, to Linda Sibley, who helped me through my master's thesis, down through you know, a collegial group that I was in, the National Alliance of Third World Creative Arts Therapists and Sarah McGee, because um, she had a non-traditional approach to art therapy, bringing in um, traditional healing from Africa um, to, as I said earlier, to Elaine Goldberg and Barbara Sobel, who mentored me with um, family art therapy. So yes, you know, so my lens now is to try to give back in a way to, you know, to be accessible. You know, I'm not all that. <laughs> so, you know, whatever I can offer to someone, I'm happy to do it. I, I, I'm happy to do it. I definitely feel the need to do that. Thank you, Cheryl. And, and I think Deanna, I just want to share with you, there are also um, in our meeting today, a number of people uh, from Spelman uh, who remember your time at Spelman. Mm -hmm. So I, I just thought I would let you know and, and have you in a warm embrace from, from all of them. I think they're very proud as we are of the work that you've done. Um, so I, I think I'll just maybe start with some of the questions uh, because they are coming in and I know that um, we'd like to have the time to get to as many of them as we're able to. Um, the first question uh, is how much writing versus art classes must be taken to major in psychology and minoring in art with the intention uh, to obtain a master's in art therapy. So I think for us, you know, we are um, at the AUC, uh, we have 
uh, Spelman, uh, Morehouse, Clark Atlanta, and the Morehouse School of Medicine. Um, but at the college and or university level, um, we uh, uh, are not necessarily um, able to say offer the MA, but we are able to maybe offer some routes for preparation. And maybe this is where that question is coming from for our undergraduate students who may be interested in following along in your own uh, footsteps. Yeah, I guess I'll kind of answer that a bit. I think a dual degree in art and psychology is ideal. Um, you know, as I said, I was a psychology major art minor, which did still give me the credits I needed to apply to those graduate programs. Um, but one thing that I think uh, students will begin to notice as they look into the art therapy programs is each program requires things a bit differently. It's not like the same amount of credit hours in psychology and art across the board. And I think that's also one of the issues when it comes to accessibility, um, especially for those who may be coming from an HBCU or, you know, spaces of the sort. So ensuring that you're getting a nice mix of psychology and art, I think, set you on the right trajectory. Mm -hmm. um, some programs you'll find are heavier in the art and the, you know, the, the studio art mm -hmm. and others are more clinical. GW is definitely leaning more to the clinical where mm -hmm. focusing on the psychological approach and theory is, is very important. Mm -hmm. um, so it really kind of, again, goes back to what you as an individual are interested in and finding that, that path, whether it's more art as therapy or whether it is that kind of clinical psychological approach. Right. Thank you. Cheryl, did you want to add anything to that? I, I pretty much agree with what Deanna is saying. Um, if I was understanding the correct question correctly, you were asking how much writing is um, involved. Is that what I heard? And I, I think the question was around sort of the, the um, you know, how much in psychology and mm -hmm. or um, art one would have to, what the balance is between the two, if one were to double major or major minor in one or the other. Yeah, I think typically um, in my experience, and again, we have this difference in time frame, but you either came in with a mi minor in psychology and, ma and made it up, made up the difference once you got into the program or you came in with a major. So it, the school would help you to compensate for where you needed to make it up. So yeah, it depends on each school. They have their philosophy and, and culture and, and, and requirements, absolutely. Great, thank you. And we have another question that's more attuned to the moment in which we're, we're all experiencing now um, as we are in our individual Zoom boxes here. <laughs> question is, with isolation at an all time high during the pandemic, what are good practices to reset or recharge personally? Mm. Personally. It's <laughs> a good question. Yeah. Um, I can answer. <laughs> I'll answer sure. one thing and it, it may not, it, well, just go, getting up and going for a walk, you yeah. know, going for a walk, sure. uh, redirecting your attention somewhere mm -hmm. else. So away from your computer, away from mm -hmm. your screen, if you, mm -hmm wear glasses, take them off and find your way. <laughs> um, but just looking at something different and actually, you know, yeah. that different thing might not be a, a, an electronic device, including mm -hmm. your telephone or your iPad, mm -hmm. but rather it might be a painting. It might be a work of art. It might be a, a book that you have. Mm -hmm. that's, that's my offering there. I love that. Yeah. I have a spiritual practice, you know, that I um, was involved in even before the pandemic, but has become much more of a disciplined approach, I'll say. Now that every morning, the first thing that I do is set aside a chunk of time just to have a reflective um, reading um, to kind of ground myself. And so it starts to clear it away, you know, whatever I've been dreaming about, whatever I'm carrying from the next day, whatever I'm anticipating, you know, um, because some cases I'm like, oh, you know, others I'm like, oh, you know. Um, so I, I value that even more so now. And yes, getting out into my yard, working with um, flowers, I can see the weeds growing as we speak <laughs> and spending time with my grandchildren. I have seven grandchildren and they keep me going, so. 
Yeah. Just valuing anytime you can get away from the screens. Yesterday I was on screen up until after nine o'clock last night. So it can be um, off-putting. Yeah. Definitely. I also, something that I share with, it's a personal practice, but also something that I bring into therapeutic sessions and, you know, encourage my clients to do is something that I call zoning your house, zoning your space. Mm -hmm. So setting up a space primarily for art, setting up that yoga mat, if you need to stretch, making sure there's bottles or containers of water around so that when you see the water, you drink it, right? Mm -hmm. So having things open and accessible for use Mm -hmm. so that when you are in transition from your day to the next, you're kind of seeing these zones in your home and it becomes kind of a natural way to ebb and flow through the day. So mm-hmm. I've, I've found that very helpful kind of just being in isolation and in a box, literally, mm-hmm. and having those kind of opportunities moment to moment as I feel called to create or stretch or drink water or go outside. I, I love that idea of the zone because you know, if you see your water bottle or if you see your yoga mat there, like my yoga mat, I can look over there and it's rolled up in the corner. Yeah, you're probably not unrolling that. <laughs> yeah, thank you. All right, so we have another question about um, the career. And this question is, what is the earning potential for art therapists? I'm located in Southern California and feel worried that I won't be able to make a living off of working as an art therapist. Thank you. Mm. That's a very good question. I think obviously it's going to vary from jurisdiction to jurisdiction, but what I would say for where I am here in the district of Columbia, um, I had to become licensed to function independently. Right now I'm practicing with a licensed professional counselor, LPC. We are moving in the direction very soon of finishing well, it's been passed, but it's just, we still have a few little tweaks to go. I don't want to get into the details about becoming licensed art therapists. So um, it's hard to say because even now, quite honestly, my job title is not art therapist, even though I am fortunate to be in a practice where I self-identify as an art therapist and can use art therapy as my primary means of working with clients. Um, So that's another piece with making sure that the profession is recognized um, so that the salary range could be commensurate with the master's level training and all the other bells and whistles that go along with um, being able to do this work. Yeah, I would agree. It kind of varies from population to population, depending on where you work and also state by state. Mm -hmm. Um, Just thinking about the different placements and, you know, spaces that I've worked. There are times when I worked with nonprofits and was working, you know, as an independent contractor on an hourly pay. Mm -hmm. There's been times where like in a school system, I was on salary making Mm -hmm. kind of the same as a teacher would make. Mm -hmm. And then of course, working in a private practice or maybe a more entrepreneurial path, there's opportunities to kind of expand, you know, uh, income flow, if you will. So Mm -hmm. There's, there's definitely a lot of variety mm-hmm. um, in how much you're you know, able to make in the field. Right, and it seems to me that it would depend on how you model your practice, whether mm-hmm. it's a private practice or a private practice that has consulting to mm-hmm. institutional spaces mm-hmm. uh, and the other type of work that you might be able to do even just to raise the profile of the profession itself. Mm-hmm. Definitely. That's a, that's a great question. Of course, mm-hmm. it would vary from region to region, mm-hmm. yeah. Okay, so we have another question Um, and there are just so many thank yous. I want you both to know that so many kudos and thank you for for your work, especially, you know, this timely conversation. Um, And the question is, I'm wondering if or what your own personal studio practices or practice look like, looks Mm -hmm. like, um, and if it's important to your work as an art therapist. And Deanna, I see, um, I've, already, I've already said something about the work behind you. So maybe you should, maybe you can go begin. Ahead. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, so obviously you can see some of my, my personal works behind me. And it's, I think my evolution as an artist has its own journey, very much separate, maybe not so separate now that I say it, you know, as becoming art therapist. And I find more recently though, my art practice has adapted to the way that I'm working. So 
before painting large on large canvases was a, was my thing, but now it's much smaller, much things are a little bit um, faster in process. So I've moved into a lot of collage and, and mixed media. Photography has also been something that has served me well in those times where maybe work was taking over my life, but I still needed to find ways to document or create in some in some way. So the art make personal art making process, I think, for the art therapist is extremely important. Mm -hmm. um, even in the context of the therapeutic space and using the art as a way to respond to the feelings that come up mm -hmm. from what happened in that moment or that that time period with your client. So we, we would call that response art. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, going back to kind of like the zoning, for me, the zoning is a way to make time for the art making and is the place that I go at the end of a session before starting another, mm -hmm. where maybe I can do a quick sketch, a quick collage to kind of just displace some emotions in a positive way before stepping back up and, mm -hmm. you know, holding that space for the next person. So I do think art making is vitally important to our well being and our profession. I would agree 100%. Um, and I too have seen how my art making has ebbed and flowed over the course of my career. Um, you know, at this point, I don't feel that I have engaged in art making as consistently as I would like to, but I very much do something that you just touched on, Deanna. I tend to be a person that takes notes during the course of a session. Mm -hmm. And so in my book, I will make little thumbnail sketches, you know, sometimes capturing my response or either duplicating what the mm -hmm. client may have made just so I can keep up with it. Um, other times, because Cliff Joseph was a big influence on me and just his work in murals, I loved over the course of my career when I had an opportunity with clients. And then even now where I work um, with um, young people and with my co-workers to create murals. We actually have a huge mural in the common area. I mean, we can't go there now because of the pandemic and all, but just being able to do things on that scale um, has always been gratifying. So I miss doing it consistently. I can hear the tape playing in my head. You need to get back to your art. You need to get back to your art. You know? And I will, um, but yes, it is absolutely, in my opinion, one of the key components of being able to connect, you know, doing counter transference art sometimes in the course of my supervision sessions when I've been working with folks also is another way to, to bring information to light and to inform the work that you're going to do. So absolutely, it's very, very important. Thank you. And so the next question, I think, uh, dovetails with, with your both of your answers. And that question is, how do you practice self-care as someone who gives care? What does work-life balance look like when you give emotional labor? I think that's so important. And I think, honestly, it's a, a learning process still. Mm -hmm. I think depending where you are in your career as an art therapist, self-care kind of takes on a different lens. Mm -hmm. um, I think for me personally, more recently, it's when work is done, work is done. And like being very- Compartmentalized. Yes, like it has to be that way. You know, if I don't, it just blends together and my stuff yes. gets mixed up with that. It's just, it can be very messy. So yes. creating a, I have the, you know, the luxury in private practice to kind of cultivate a week schedule that accommodates mm -hmm. that turning it off. Mm -hmm. So picking certain times of day where I'm not working, picking certain days of the week where I am not working mm -hmm. has truly been a necessity, you know, to continue to give the care and still take care of myself. Mm -hmm. um, and I mean, I mentioned it a couple of times, but like the zoning thing for me mm -hmm. is mm -hmm. also very, very important. Stretching when I need to stretch, mm -hmm. creating when I need to create, go outside, get fresh air, like making that almost a ritual you know it's a routine it's, a, it's something that's becoming very habitual and just you know my normal way of moving through the day yes I would agree trying to be able to compartmentalize um, because I work in a clinic um, what I have seen lately because of the pandemic on the one hand working virtually has been challenging but then on the other hand is has increased accessibility mm -hmm. so for those families who have young children where it was harder for them to come to us because they have multiple children they can just you know connect 
virtually. But then what happens is since my caseload has gotten larger, I'm carrying all of that around with me. And mm -hmm. some of the cases have more levels of concern than others. So I have to kind of make sure that at the end of the day, I shut it off. Now, it's not all, I'm not always successful because there are a few cases that I'm processing even after the fact. But yes, trying to get out into the yard. I used to be able to travel, which I long to be able to do again. Um, watching crazy things on TV, <laughs> you know, just taking my mind away. Um, reading, reading and just reflecting. But yeah, trying to make that hard stop, if you will, so that it doesn't take over because I think that once that happens, your energy, what you have left to give becomes depleted. So you have to find a way to recharge. You definitely have to find a way to recharge. Having time to play. You know, yeah. Yes. In your day to day, like, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. Definitely time to play. So we've got time for maybe one more question, uh, depending on the answer, maybe two, we'll see just with a few minutes. Um, but I, I like this one. And, and I think that your answer um, to the last question, again, invites this one. The question is, how can we make art therapy accessible to community members, regardless of their income levels? Mm -hmm. And the person who asked this question goes on to say, I'm asking this because I believe art therapy is essential and not a luxury. Mm -hmm. I see a contradiction between how specialized art therapy is and my desire as a future art therapist to make this accessible to my local community. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think part of my journey has been to try to answer that question moving away from the clinical work in a psychiatric hospital or in a school setting and bringing it into community, into an individual's daily life has been kind of my mission. Mm. I, I think now that we are opening up the opportunity for telehealth, mm -hmm. it is in some ways, not in all ways, but in some ways increasing accessibility. But again, I know Cheryl, uh, you mentioned like, people are using their cell phones. They might not have access to the technology. So there's that as well. Mm -hmm. um, but some of the things that, you know, that are coming to mind are working alongside local artists, bringing public artworks into the community, engaging people to go see an art installation in their community. These are things that I have done, mm -hmm. you know, that are free of charge. You don't have, you know, it's a community art site. It's mm -hmm. something that they can then interact with. Mm -hmm. um, there's so many amazing nonprofits that are art based where I think they are interested in kind of creating those pathways of healing through their their organization. So, again, those could be, you know, ways to make it more accessible. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think there's so much space for innovation here, which makes mm -hmm. me really hopeful. Mm -hmm. And so I hope that question inspires people who are interested in the field to kind of answer the question and find the solutions and not feel like that's a barrier to doing the work. Mm -hmm. I think what I would add to that, because I'm in agreement with everything you said, Deanna, would be, you know, once you have accomplished your training as an art therapist, to, you know, balance between, yes, having to be able to make a living, which is challenging, but also recognizing that there are various places where you might be able to do this work. So it may have to be a combination of working in a clinic or in a school and then providing it in a community recreation center or working in a summer camp program or working in an after school program or working in a church setting, you know, where you can get the word out to people who might not necessarily seek an art therapist, because, you know, one of the legacies that we might see as a result of the pandemic, you know, we already are getting a highlight on the disparity on healthcare and health conditions, but will there be stigma for people who have been exposed or have suffered from the virus? Mm -hmm. And will they not be able to receive the services or, you know, even if they have recovered, will they still have some existing condition. Exactly. Yeah. So, you know, being able to see that as another pathway to help people to express what that's like for them via art making may be another 
opportunity for us going forward. And, you know, just finding ways as best we can to meet people where they are and, mm -hmm. and try to, to offer this as an option to them. Yeah. Yeah. Beautiful. Well, I, I think we're just past the one o'clock hour. That was uh, our last question, but I do want to maybe tie up a couple of the other questions that um, that were in the Q&A function, um, especially as they relate to this last question. You know, how do we how do we bring this practice to to our communities, to our local communities, communities that we know um, need uh, need need the services that you provide. Um, one of your answers around, you know, telehealth um, and telemedicine, which we know is increasingly what we're all doing, especially being sheltered away uh, due to the pandemic. And I think technology might be another way to answer this question as well, you know, as technology changes and adapts. And even though some people may only have a telephone from which to work, Zoom can get on that phone and there are ways that we can all communicate. Mm -hmm. So um, I really hope that we have another opportunity to engage with the both of you. It's been Thank such you. an enjoyable, enjoyable lunchtime hour. And um, everyone I know who's been with us for this past hour has just been saying thank you, thank you, thank you, and singing your praises. Um, again, Dr. Cheryl Doby Copeland uh, and Deanna Bartman, Barton, excuse me, Spellman alumna. Thank you again <laughs> for joining us for our virtual career week. Thank you for this opportunity. Right. Thank you, Deanna. <laughs> good to see you. Thank you. All right. All right. Be well, everybody. <laughs> Bye. -bye. Take good Bye. care. Thank you.